Well, good evening, and we're very thankful for the presence of every one of you. Uh, Andy, I don't know uh, which one of us was more thrilled, but I think that I can safely say I was more thrilled when you called and gave me the, uh, the invitation than you were when I said yes, because this has been on my mind ever since, I believe it was January, when you first called and, and offered the invitation. I appreciate the elders of this congregation for the uh, opportunity to be back here at Hillview Terrace. It has been a joy for me to be with you the past several days. Um, this is my first time to be at the lectureship. I've been back here, of course, to hold meetings over the years, but have not been able to attend the lectureship, and I've been totally impressed. Uh, my other contact with the School of Preaching has been to speak in chapel a few times when I've been in the area. So uh, that's just a very small portion of what's been going on here over the years. Of course, I've been acquainted with many of the faculty members for uh, longer than either they or I probably care to remember the number of years, but for quite a long time, and uh, just am very, very impressed and uh, greatly appreciative for the work that's being done here. And I've heard a lot of good things about Andy Robison and the work that he's done since he's been directing the school. If you have your Bible with you tonight and want to turn to Luke chapter 9, we're going to be reading verses 28 through 36, be speaking concerning the transfiguration of Jesus. Here, the inspired writer Luke records for us, Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings, that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him, who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep, and when they were fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son. Hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things that they had seen. Now, for a long time, when I read this account of the Transfiguration, I always considered it to be something of, of a mystery. There's just something about this, this scene that is hard for me to imagine. I believe it's one of those things that you would have had to have been there to actually feel the entire effect of it. I don't think that it's something that just even reading the words, we get the full effect, although Luke, the inspired writer by the Holy Spirit, has given us this message, has recorded these words for us, but reading it wouldn't have been the same as actually being there and seeing it. Can you imagine what Peter and John and James must have been feeling? Can you imagine the, the terror? Several of the speakers today have spoken of several of the incidents in the life of Christ that, that brought terror or fear, a reverent fear, but a fear nonetheless. When the widow of Nain's son, I think Bruce was talking about this, when the widow of Nain's son was raised from the dead, those who were around it, they feared greatly. The things that Jesus did and all the things surrounding Jesus brought fear and, and amazement and marveling among the people who saw and even who heard Jesus speak. But of all the things that happened, this one, the transfiguration, is one that to me almost defies description. And yet, our assignment is to describe it and to talk about it. And so we're going to tonight to look at five aspects of the transfiguration of Jesus. Number one, we're going to be looking at the fact that it was a destination for prayer. If you look here in Luke chapter 9 and verse 28, you'll find that the Bible says that about eight days after these things, that Jesus went up on the mountain, notice, to pray. This was the purpose for him going up on the mountain. Now, many times already this week, it's been mentioned that Luke, one of his themes, one of his emphases, is Jesus' praying life. For example, in Luke chapter 3, in verse 21, 
Luke, of the ones who record the baptism of Jesus, is the only one who says that when he was baptized, while he was praying, the heavens were torn asunder and the Spirit of God came down in the form of a dove. He was praying after his baptism. In Luke chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, as Jesus' fame was spreading and more and more people kept crowding around him, Luke says in verse 16 that he would seek lonely places or deserted places in order to pray. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16, Jesus went up on a mountain and he spent an entire night in prayer. And then, of course, the next day, as his disciples were around him, he chose from among those disciples twelve, whom he also called apostles. And they then became with him and traveled with him through the rest of his public ministry. In Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 14, and today we had a great lesson from Keith Cress on the persistent widow in verses 1 through 9, and then later tomorrow we'll have a lesson on the uh, Pharisee and the publican, two parables recorded only by Luke, both of which have as their subject praying, how we need to be praying. If you look right here in our own text in Luke chapter 9, go back to verse 18, you'll find there that Luke says that it happened as Jesus was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? <laughs> Jesus was praying right when he was asking that question, that great question. So when Jesus is going up onto this mountain, he had a purpose to go up there. And the purpose for his going was to pray. Pray. Now again, this point has been made several times, but I don't think that it can be said too much. If Jesus saw the need to spend this much time in prayer, if Jesus saw the need to get away from the crowds and from the hustle and bustle of life and to find the time to pray to His Heavenly Father, then what kind of lesson should that teach us? It should teach us that we also need to spend much more time in prayer. Keith this morning in his lesson used the, the illustration of the lifeline of uh, an underwater diver who is connected with the boat above with a, a line uh, that pumps oxygen into his helmet. And he likened that to our connection with God in prayer. For our very spiritual lives, we need to spend much time in prayer. Jesus taught us, but Jesus showed us by example our need for prayer. So the Mount of Transfiguration was for the purpose, it was a destination for prayer. But then secondly, we find that it was a revelation of glory. It was a revelation of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you look here, the Bible says that Jesus' face was altered. That is, literally, it became other. It became different. It changed in its appearance. And then it says that His clothes were white and glistening. The word glistening is used only one time. This particular Greek word was used only one time in the New Testament. In secular Greek, it was used to describe the brilliance of a lightning flash. Uh, last week, I believe it was last Wednesday night, we had a thunderstorm that came through Mountain Home. Can you believe a thunderstorm in Arkansas? <laughs> that We have them quite often. It happened to be one of those nights I wasn't sleeping very well. I have about one of those a week, and it comes on a different night, and it doesn't really matter what's going on, and I never know what night it's going to be. But that night was one of those. I began to hear the thunder when it was just a low rumble in the distance. And I laid awake, and I heard it getting closer, and getting closer, and getting closer, and getting louder, until then I also began to see the lightning flashes. Now, Diane slept all the way through it. The next morning I said, wasn't that some story? She said, what storm was that? I said, the one that came through last night. Didn't it wake you up? Didn't the lightning flashes? It was so bright. It doesn't last very long, but the brilliance of it. And that's what is describing the look, the appearance of Jesus' clothing. Glistening white, like a lightning flash. And then it also says, we got another one up there, didn't we? There we go. Uh, the Bible also says that Jesus' companions in conversation with Him also were in glory. They appeared with Him also in glory, down in verse 31. 
and then the three men who accompanied him, Peter, John, and James, as they were on that mountain, they were seeing this. They saw these men, and they saw this glory. And then we find that what is this glory all about? What, what is the significance? What, what's the background here? And not only the appearance, the glorious appearance of Jesus' face and Jesus' clothing, but, but also then this cloud that overshadows them and the voice coming out of the cloud. That's where I'd like to spend probably a majority of our time tonight. This is going to be the longest of the five points that we have. But uh, the glory. Look back to Exodus chapter 14. In verses 19 and 20, and this is when Israel has just been coming out of Egypt. The Passover, has just, the original Passover, the death of the firstborn, has just taken place. The Israelites are coming out, and they are now standing right in front of the Red Sea. And then, behind them, Pharaoh has changed his mind again. Surprise, surprise. And the chariots are coming back upon them. They have the Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army coming from behind, and the people are crying out to Moses, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Remember how God told them to go forward, to cross the land. But before that, you find in Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 and 20, the Bible says that the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And so it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. It was a cloud of darkness to the one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. This is divine protection, divine security for the nation of Israel provided by the cloud of God. And then next, in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 9, when the people are at the foot of Mount Sinai, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with you and believe you forever. And then, chapter 24, and verses 15 through 18, we find that now Moses is going up, on, up uh, on that mountain, and it says that Moses went up the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. So Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain forty days and forty nights. Notice how again the presence of the Lord is signified by that cloud. And then next, we find over in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 to 38. This is now the, the tabernacle has been completed. It has been constructed. And we'll read beginning at verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, fire was over it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So again, the glory of the Lord filling the tabernacle. But then again, look over to 1 Kings chapter 8. And when uh, chapter 8 beginning at verse 10, this is describing now the completion of the temple that Solomon had constructed. It came to pass when the priests came out of the holy place that the cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The cloud and the glory of the Lord joined together on all of these various occasions. Now this next point, and I told Emmanuel I was going to use him as my footnote reference for this one. Clear back about 32 years ago, I believe it was, we were, no, longer than that, 34 years ago, we were over in Columbus, Ohio in a class under Rex Turner Sr. studying the book of Ezekiel. During that class period, Emmanuel made the following point. Look over to Ezekiel chapter 8. 
Ezekiel chapter 8 and verse 4. And this is now, Ezekiel is carried in the Spirit. And he's seeing what he, although he's a captive in Babylon, he's seeing what's happening in Jerusalem. And why it is that God is punishing Jerusalem. And why it will be that the Babylonians will overrun the city and tear it to the ground and burn the temple. And all the sins that were being committed there. But among all of those descriptions, notice there are several places where Ezekiel is shown the glory of the Lord. For example, in verse 4 of, of Ezekiel chapter 8, the glory of the, the God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. That is, it was in the court of the temple, in the inner part of the temple. And then in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 3, now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. Now where was the cherub in the temple? The cherubim were over the Ark of the Covenant, weren't they? And their wings touched in the middle and then their other wings touched on the sides. Well, the glory of the Lord comes from there and comes to the threshold of the temple. And then in chapter 10 and verse 4, Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and paused over the threshold of the temple. The house was filled with the cloud. The court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. But then in verses 18 and 19 of chapter 10, Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. The cherubim lifted their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house. And the glory of the God of Israel was above them. These cherubim are the ones that Ezekiel had seen in chapter 1, uh, his introductory vision. And then finally in chapter 11 and verse Verse 23, the saddest verse of all. The glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which is on the east side of the city. What does that represent? Well, if you go back to Exodus, that cloud stood between the Egyptians and the Israelites for their protection. When the tabernacle was completed, the cloud of the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, symbolizing his, that He was pleased with how it was going, and this is where He is to be worshipped. And the same thing with the temple of Solomon. When it was finished, the cloud of the glory of the Lord filled that temple, signifying the Lord's presence is there. What does it mean when the Lord's presence departs from there? It means that their security is gone. Their protection is gone. No longer is the Lord being watchful over them and protecting them. Now the city is open. Now it's open for those Babylonians to come in and take them. Ezekiel is seeing this in a vision. But what it represents, the glory of the Lord, the, the Hebrew word is the, the Shekinah. The, the cloud, the, the glory, the, the brilliance, the presence of the Lord. But then... The text that we're looking at in Luke chapter 9, we find in verse 26, just before the account of the transfiguration. Notice what Jesus says there. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Glory is how Jesus was going to come. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. When Caiaphas the high priest put Jesus under oath and said, Tell us, are you the Son of God? Jesus said, It is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you that hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. The clouds coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, look back to Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. Here, Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. We just read that in Luke, didn't we? We're in Matthew. And here it is over here, clear back in Daniel. Jesus is using Old Testament language to describe His own coming. Now, here in Daniel, the coming of Jesus is not coming to the earth. It's going back to the Father. He's coming to the Ancient of Days. That is His ascension back to the Father. If you look over at Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, what happened when Jesus ascended into heaven? Remember the disciples who were there with them, and after he had blessed them, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And if you look at verse 11, then you will find where the angel says, do not, be, or do not stand gazing up into heaven. This same Jesus whom you see, have seen go into heaven shall so come in like manner. How did he go? He was received with a cloud. How is he going to come back? He's coming back with the clouds. How do we know that? Not only Acts chapter 1 verses 9 and 11. 1, Corinthians cha or 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18. Where Jesus is going to come and those who are alive and remain will be raised to meet the Lord in the clouds. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then also in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7. Behold, He comes with the clouds and every eye shall see. And then in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 31, there we don't find him saying he comes in clouds. He uses this expression, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. We might have expected clouds there, mightn't we? But he's coming in glory. The glory, the glorious cloud, the cloud of the glory of the Lord. Friends, when we read these passages concerning these clouds, and including the one of the transfiguration, the Bible writers are not interested in giving us a weather report. They're not telling us what the weather is going to be like the day the Lord comes back. They are emphasizing the glory of the Lord in His coming. He went to the Lord in, in glory. He is coming back in glory. And we have here in our passage in Luke chapter 9, verses 28 and following, the transfiguration. We have a brief glimpse. It's like the curtain has been slightly pulled aside just for a moment to give us a glimpse of that glory. Peter, John, and James saw it. They saw it firsthand. They were eyewitnesses. Peter wrote about it in 2 Peter, long after, of course, the time that Jesus was in, on His earthly ministry. Because According to the other synoptic gospels, Jesus tells them not to tell this, not to tell this until after the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Well, Peter wrote about it later. The others, James, we don't have the writing from him, but John. I wonder if John refers to this. Well, we don't have any explicit reference, but I want you to look at John chapter 1 and verse 14. A lot of people think that this passage, and I always thought that it simply referred to everything that John saw regarding Jesus and His works, but we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. Could that be what John is referring to? Is that the background perhaps, the Mount of Transfiguration in the background of what John says, we beheld His glory? Yes, John did. John was on that mountain. He beheld the glory of the Lord in the change of his appearance, but he also beheld the glory of the Lord God in the cloud that overshadowed them and the voice that came from it. You know, we sometimes sing the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. What Jesus experienced here on the Mount of Transfiguration wasn't a foretaste of His glory. It was a reminiscence of His glory. It was bringing to His mind the glory that He had before He came to this earth. John 17 and verse 5, Jesus there prays, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had with Thee before the world was. Or for example, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, where Paul there talks about Christ thinking it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and being found in the likeness of a man, humbled himself, becoming obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. But God has highly exalted him and has given him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, whether of things in heaven or on the earth or under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice here that Jesus was in the form of God, but He took on Himself human form. And then He is back to being in the glory of God. And then also look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Without him, uh, All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. 
And then as we said a few verses later in verse 14, that word became flesh. And we beheld his glory, John says, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. And then in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, where again Paul talks about Christ Jesus being the... Uh, in the likeness of God, the image of God, the one by whom God created all things and for whom God created all things, and the one by whom everything consists or is held together. And in Colossians 2 and verse 9, in Jesus all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in human bodily form. Or for example, Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4, the descriptions of the Son by whom God has spoken to us, the one by whom He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory, the express image of His person, upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as He has by, by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." All of these passages show us the glory that Christ had, the glory that He gave up, but the glory that He then went back to. And here on the Mount of Transfiguration we see what we might call a cameo, a very short glimpse of that glory of Jesus that He had before and to which He was going back. It also might help us understand a little bit better if you look back to Luke chapter 9. Look down at verse 41. Remember, as soon as he comes back down from that mountain, there's a crowd of people around the mountain, around the foot of the mountain, and there's an argument going on, and uh, a man calls out from the crowd, and he asks Jesus to help him because he would brought his son to his disciples, asking them to heal him, and they couldn't. Look at Jesus' response here. O faithless and perverse generation, how, shall, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? When Jesus had that reminiscence of His glory, what He had left and what was waiting for Him, can you understand perhaps a little better why it is that He is wanting to get back there more quickly? How long do I have to be here when this is what's waiting for me to come? So here we have, first of all, it was a destination for prayer. It's a revelation of glory. And then next, there was a conversation going on among Jesus and Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah, two of the greatest names from the Old Testament. Moses, the lawgiver and the deliverer of Israel. And of course, it wasn't Moses who gave the law. God gave the law, but He gave the law to Moses and from Moses to the people of Israel. The lawgiver, Elijah, the fiery prophet, the man who spoke with fiery words, very strong words, the man who opposed Ahab and Jezebel. Brother Deloach mentioned last night about Elijah's uh, being down in the dump, so to speak, after his great victory on Mount Carmel. But we also find that Elijah was taken up into heaven in a whirlwind, in a chariot of fire. No wonder he's called the fiery prophet. And he did so many miracles that were similar to the ones that Jesus was doing. And he preached with the power that John had preached with. And so we find that Moses and Elijah there are talking with Jesus. Can you imagine the number of things that they might have had to talk about? But they had one topic of conversation that's recorded for us. They were talking about his approaching decease. And that translates the word that normally is transferred, transferred, translated exodus. An exodus, his, his departure, his going away. Now Bruce again this morning, or this afternoon rather, mentioned the words uh, precious and uh, what was the other one? Blessed. blessed, thank you. Mind went blank there for a moment. Precious and blessed, those are two words we don't associate normally with death, do we? Well here's a third one accomplish. Do we accomplish death? Most of us don't. Most of us do anything and everything we can to keep from dying. We take medicines, we go to doctors, we'll do regimens, we'll do diets, nearly anything and everything we do. We don't think of death as an accomplishment. That's something that happens in spite of all of our efforts to prevent it. But Jesus' death is an accomplishment. It's an accomplishment because it was the fulfillment of the Father's will. 
This was the ultimate thing that Jesus had come to do. Yes, He came to teach. Yes, He came to seek and save the lost. Yes, He came to give us an example, but ultimately, He came to die. He came to die an atoning death for you and for me. He came to accomplish that death on the cross for the salvation of human beings. And Jesus accomplished it. And that is what these people, Moses and Elijah, were talking about. If you look back to verse 22 of Luke chapter 9, keeping things in context, Jesus had just told the apostles, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, here at the Transfiguration, Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah, and the subject of conversation is His approaching death and His accomplishment of it. But then, if you look down in verse 51 of Luke chapter 9, You'll notice that there it says, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for Him to be received up, he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. He's beginning on that last stage, that last phase of his ministry as he's going to Jerusalem. What's going to happen? That's where it's going to happen, that the Son of Man is going to be handed over, delivered up. He's going to be killed, but he will also be raised on that third day. And then next, we have an affirmation of Jesus' identity. An affirmation of his identity. Look back again, Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. Now it happened that as he was alone praying, his disciples joined him and asked them, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowds say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. The Christ of God. That was Peter's answer. Now what do we have here coming from the, crowd, the cloud? The voice out of the cloud says, This is my beloved Son. This is my beloved Son. What's He doing? The cloud, the voice from the cloud, God, the Father, is affirming exactly what Peter has just said. It wasn't that long between the time that Peter said that and what God is now affirming. It is an affirmation of the identity of Jesus as God's Son. And we find this here in the Transfiguration. And then next, it is also a declaration of Jesus' authority. Because the, cloud, the voice from the cloud didn't stop by saying, This is my beloved Son, it added these words. We didn't hear this at the baptism of Jesus. We found that affirmation of identity there also. But here, these words are added. Hear Him! Listen to Him. There was a time when Moses was to be listened to. The law of Moses was God's covenant with the nation of Israel. And the nation of Israel were under a covenant obligation sealed with blood, with the blood of animals. They were under a covenant obligation to observe the stipulations and the regulations found within that covenant. But they didn't do it. And so God sent the prophets represented by Elijah. The prophets didn't really preach a new doctrine. All they did was call the people back to the covenant, to come back to the covenant. Leave your foreign gods. Leave your idols. Leave all this vain worship. Leave your sins and come back. It was a call for repentance. Repent of your sins. Come back to what God told you in the covenant that He made with you through Moses. The people didn't listen to the prophets either. And so now God has sent His Son, His beloved Son, the Son upon whom He has placed all authority. Remember Jesus says after His resurrection, all authority has been given me in heaven and on earth. And that is why the Great Commission carries with it all the authority of heaven. That is why when we go out preaching the pure and simple gospel of the New Testament, that we have the authority of heaven behind us. It's not our words. It's not our message. It's not our gospel. It's not our way of salvation. It's God's way. And as long as we preach it the way God revealed it, we have that authority behind us. 
not because of who we are, but because of what the message is and who Jesus is and who His Father is. We find in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we quoted part of it a little while ago. By the way, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 is the other place in the New Testament that you find what's called the periodic style of the Greek literature, like Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It's all one sentence, one long sentence, and it's marked with alliteration. It's marked with a very high and flowery, lofty speech. But when you boil that one long sentence of four verses down, what is saying is, God has spoken. Everything else describes either the God who spoke or when He spoke, who He spoke to, or by whom He has spoken. God, long ago, spoke to the fathers by the prophets, and He did it in a variety of ways and at a variety of times. But in these last days, He has spoken unto us by His Son. He is the one who speaks. He is the one to whom we are to listen. He is the one we are to hear in all things, whatever He will command us. If you're here tonight, you've never yet obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to listen to these following words of Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 24, If you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. In other words, you must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says in Luke chapter 13 and verse 3, Except you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus Himself tells us repentance, a turning away from sin, a giving up of the love and practice of sin. That's a prerequisite. It's a necessity. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Whoever will confess me before men, the same will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. Whoever denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father who is in heaven. In other words, we need to make a confession of our faith in Jesus, that He is the Son of God. And then Jesus says in Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Friends, those are the words of Jesus. Every one of those passages, you look at them in context. John 8, 24, Luke 13, 3, uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, Mark 16, 16. Those are the words recorded of Jesus in context. These are Jesus. You need to listen to Jesus. Doesn't the cloud there on the Mount of Transfiguration tell us we need to hear Him? Listen to Him. This is what He says. This is God's way of salvation. We have the authority of heaven to preach that very message. You have the authority of heaven to obey that message and then expect to receive all the blessings and all the promises that are attached to your obedience. If you're here tonight and you're, not a, and you're a wayward Christian, Jesus didn't speak to this point, but His Word speaks to it. Peter speaks to it over in Acts chapter 8 as he is telling Simon the sorcerer, Repent of this thy wickedness, turn away from it, and pray to God that you, the iniquity of your heart might be, might be forgiven. That is how a wayward Christian is restored and forgiven and restored to faithful and dedicated service. If you've never done the first by obeying the gospel of Christ, or having done that, if you're a wayward Christian and need to come back, will you listen to the word of God, to the words of Jesus? Will you submit to the authority of heaven tonight and respond to the gospel invitation while we stand and sing to encourage you? Oh, how sweet.